So there is this very interesting idea called tail recursion, which is also referred to as tail call optimization, which is also called as tail call optimization uh, in compilers, right? I'll explain what it does with the same example that we have, right? This is the regular recursion, right? This is my recursion, right? This is my recursion that we have already seen, right? Standard recursion. This is called, so this function, I call it as f. There is another function that I'm defining called f tail recursion. Here, tr basically stands for tail recursion. So uh, first, I'll convince you that this function also computes factorial. Okay. So what does it do? Suppose if I say, if I want to compute factorial of 5, I will call ftr 5 comma 1. This value, so this is the fact. So if I want to compute n factorial, right, I will call this function with, this function has two parameters, n and a, right? This a is also called as accumulator. This a, I mean, is also referred to as accumulator in this case, right? So my n is here, my a is going to be equal to 1, okay, if I want to compute n factorial. Now let's look at what happens, ftr 5 comma 1, if n equals to 0 or 1, return a, else return ftr n minus 1 n star a, okay, so what happens to this, when I call this, okay, the standard recursion, imagine in the standard recursion type of setup, what happens, if I call this, it will call ftr, right, n minus 1, which is 4, then n into a. What is n into a? My n is 5, right? a is 1. So n into 5, uh, sorry, n into a is 5, right? So this will again call another function, right? This will again call ftr, right? n minus 1, which is 3, because n minus 1 is 3, n into a, n into a is 20. So if you notice, by the time we came here, by the time we came to FTR3, this A has the value of 5 into 4, right? This already has, so if you look at this, what I have in this accumulator or A is already 5 into 4. And I'm still to process 3 to 1, right? That's, that's why it's called an accumulator because it is accumulating the product from N up to this value, right? From 5, from the initial value of N up to this value. So this will again call FTR 2 comma because N minus 1 is 2 and N into A, 3 into 20 is 60. Now what is there in my accumulator or A? I have 5 into 4 into 3 already here, right? So this will call FTR of 1 comma multiply both of them 120, right? Now if N equals to 0 or 1, return A. So what it will return? It will return 120, problem solved. So through this simple flow, I have shown you that this function, this FTR function also computes factorial. The primary difference is it is using this accumulator. Okay. So I hope you're convinced, right? That this also returns n factorial just like this. Both of them are recursive. Look at this. This is also a recursive function because I'm calling fn minus one here. This is also recursive because I'm calling FTR from within FTR. Now comes the fun part, but there are some very interesting differences between both of them. Okay, so first I convinced you that both of them are correct. Now I'll start showing you the differences between both of them. Okay, this is called, so actually this is supposed to be called, uh, this is actually called, not supposed to be, this is called tail recursion. Okay, this is called as non-tail recursion. This is called as non-tail recursion, or sometimes it's also called as head recursion, right? So what is the fundamental difference between both? Okay, and we'll see why it is important. Remember, remember this very foundational thing that when we used a recursive algorithm, we got the call stack. We had a problem with call stack occupying order of n space. But in the iterative algorithm of factorial, my space complexity was only order of one. So tail recursion is one hack through which we will reduce this. Tail recursion is an idea through which we will reduce this. Okay, let's see how to do it step by step. Okay, so the key difference, the most important aspect here, the, the key point or the most important point here, here is, look at this, here in this, in this situation, okay, there is a very, very important distinction between uh, head recursion and tail recursion. In this head recursion, when I call F5, right, I, my F5 is supposed to be computed as 5 into F4 
right? Which means without the value. So I can only return from this function. I can only return from this function after I have the value of f4 and then after I get, so imagine if I have f4 here, suppose n equals to 5, okay? I call this, which again calls f3, so on, so forth. Let's assume I have the value of f n minus 1, which is f4. After I get the value of f4 to this function with n equals to 5, I have one more operation to perform, which is the multiplication operation, right? When I, when I get my f4 value, I have to multiply 5 with 4, 5 with f4, right? So after recursion, so the key thing here, the key thing in this case, the key thing in this case is after the recursion, after the recursion returns, after the recursion returns to the original function, returns to the original function, I still have some operations to be performed. I still have operations to be performed, right? In this case, look at this. In this case, what do I have? So in this case, what do I have? After I get f4, I have to multiply 5 with f4 to return finally, right? In this case, while in the case of tail recursion, look at this. In the case of tail recursion, if I call ftr 5 comma 1, okay, which would be called as, which would again now call. So let's assume n equals to 5 and a equals to 1. So what would call here? It would call 4 and what would it call now? This is 5. Now once ftr 4 comma 5, so this calls ftr 4 comma 5. Now, once FTR 4 comma 5 returns, because this is a recursive call, right? After F, once, I, once I return from FTR 4 comma 5, there are no operations to be performed here. Whatever value it returns, I can simply return it, right? So after the recursion, so in this case, what's happening? After the recursion, after the recursion returns to the original calling function, after the recursion returns to the original calling function, no operations need to be performed. No operations except return. So I'm basically returning whatever I get here, I'm returning back. No operations except return need to be performed. No operations except this need to be performed. Right? That's a key difference. This is this is the very, very important difference. Here, after my F4 returns, when I'm calling F5. After my F4 returns, I have a multiplication operation that I'm performing here before I return the final value. Here, there is nothing like that. I get my return value and I'm returning that as is. So this is called tail recursion. Okay, this is a key property of tail recursion. So if you write your code in such a way that after the recursive function returns, there are no operations to be performed. There are no operations except return. Then, this function is said to be tail recursive. That's the definition of tail recursion, right? Very simple, right? Now what happens if you have tail recursion? If you implement your code using tail recursion, so let's assume you implement your code using tail recursion versus non-tail or head recursion, right? So let's assume you implement your code using tail recursion. What happens is at the end of the day, whatever code you write, the compiler takes that code, the compiler takes that code, and compiler converts that into executable code, right? Into machine executable code. Most modern compilers, most modern compilers of major programming languages, name any of the major programming languages, right? Most modern compilers, what they do is, the moment they recognize tail recursion, because in the case of tail recursion, the fun part is this, whenever this returns, I can simply return the same value here without doing any computations which means I don't have to store any variables here. While in this case, on my call stack, see in this case, what happens? In the case of regular recursion, if you recall, in the case of regular recursion, I had to store everything in my call stack, five into some placeholder. That placeholder I can only fill after the function returns, after F4 returns, right? So I had to store all of them on the call stack. But in the case of tail recursion, in the case of tail recursion, I don't actually need a call stack. There is no need of a call stack. There is no need of a call stack because, because there are no placeholders anymore, right? As soon as FTR 4 comma 5 returns to me, whatever value it returns, I can return that as the, as the output of FTR 5 comma 1, right? I can directly return it without having store any variables or anything on the call stack. 
So what most modern compilers, what most modern compilers do is the moment they recognize tail recursion, they do something called as compiler optimization. Compilers, there is one stage. So again, we learn lots of details when we learn about compilers and compiler design, right? There is a whole, whole great idea and there's a whole nice subject at undergraduate level computer science called compiler design. Very, very interesting subject. So we'll learn more details when we learn compiler design. But most modern compilers, they have a stage called code optimization. So they have a stage where they take the code and they try to optimize the code automatically as much as they can based on a bunch of rules. Okay, this code optimization is basically a rule based system. It's basically a rule based algorithms basically. So the moment a compiler recognizes tail recursion, it can recognize tail recursion very easily. Because along with this, I don't have anything. I don't have any operator. As soon as most modern compilers recognize tail recursion, they convert a recursive code internally. Okay, they actually convert. They actually convert recursive code into iterative code automatically. They convert recursive code into iterative code so that you don't have, you don't actually need the call stack. Even intuitively, if you think about it, intuitively, if you think about it, you don't require a call stack here because whatever is it returning, you return the same thing. The same concept, the compilers, when it is optimizing the code this in the stage called code optimization, where it has some rules and algorithms through which it automatically takes a tail recursive code. It automatically takes a tail recursive code and converts that into iterative code so that you don't have any issue of call stack. That means if you implement your code like this in a modern compiler, again, older compilers do not have this feature. Most modern compilers that we use today have this feature. The moment you write your code like this and when you give it to the compiler. So when I give my FTR, when I give my FTR to, let's say, a C, C++, whatever major programming language compiler, when I give it to a modern compiler, even though FTR is recursive, because it is tail recursive, it will actually convert that into an iterative algorithm internally. Okay. So the exact details of how it does it, we will learn that in a subject called compiler design. We'll hold on to it. But it's important to know that if you can write your code using tail recursion, you have the best of both worlds. Right. If you can write your code with tail recursion, your code is recursive which means it is readable, it is easy to understand, it is easy to handle boundary cases, all of that. Anyway, compiler makes it iterative so that your space complexity, so that your space complexity is taken care of gracefully. You don't have to worry about your space complexity anymore because the call stack is not there. So your space complexity in this case, with a modern compiler, your actual runtime space complexity is actually order of one with a modern compiler, right? Because it has taken the tail recursive code and convert because your modern compiler converts it into iterative code, right? So if you can write code, it's always preferable to write tail recursive code instead of head recursive code. Okay. And you understood the difference here, right? It's very, very important. If you're writing recursive code, always try and write tail recursive code so that the call stack issue is resolved. So the space complexity is better, but let's be honest here. Writing tail recursive code is sometimes harder then rate writing straightforward uh, recursive code. Okay. So there is some effort needed here, but your compiler will take care of converting your still recursive code. As long as it is still recursive, it will still take it and convert into iterative. Very, very interesting properties of modern compilers.